Um, what's up, late studiers? Okay, you guys got like 17 hours until the exam, right? And you probably just touched the practice midterm. You're here, I'm assuming. Okay, so I'm Gabe, and this is Scott, and we're just undergrad TAs. It's like, where do I go? He's stuck down. Oh, down. Yeah. Oh, I have to with the no, mouse. No, 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 you just have to click once. Oh, wait. Oh. All right, here we go. Just like up and down. Okay. Oh, oh, there we oh, go. Oh. Now it's working. Okay. So <laughs> I got real it. fast a disclaimer. We're undergrad TAs. We aren't graders. We aren't the grad TAs. We're not the his PhD students. We don't have the answer key. This is our way that we work through this. So in order to make sure that this relationship works, you guys have to understand that. So like very unlikely, but it is possible that some of these might be incorrect. If it is, let's talk about it. Um, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna go through the first question. So hash functions are used to encrypt values. What, is, what do people think? Anyone? Guesses? All right, just throw a guess. Uh, I don't know, are they really used to encrypt values? I thought they were for like, they're for like- Is this true or false in binary? You just say true or false. false. Good, yep, that's correct, it's false. Okay, that's true. okay, cool, false. And here's why. So remember, recall that hash functions are only one way. So remember his fruit in a blender into the shot glass analogy? So like you could throw the fruit in the hash function, it blends it up, and the output's a smoothie. And you cannot go back. Unless you're like damn it, like time so. And then there's like one of my pet peeves, and this is what causes a lot of people confusion is say it with me, hashes are not dehash, decrypt, or reverse. So the difference between hash functions and encryption is hashes are one way, okay? That's like the big thing. And I don't know if you guys look through the practice midterm, but there's a lot of questions on hashes and hash functions. So I'm assuming it's a very important topic he wants you guys to actually understand. Uh, next. Oh, sorry. I don't see how hashes are encrypted. So the, the key is that, is the keyword encryption. Encryption or implies that it can be decrypted, which hashes can't. So yeah, so encryption means you can go both ways. So like you encrypt the value, there's a, so, there's a key or something that you can make it go backwards. Anyone have any questions with hashes? Yeah. Is it fair a study of being able to break hashes? And isn't the point of not having collision is not defining patterns in plain text to break a hash? So you don't break, uh, you, that's why we say break and not decrypt or dehash or any of this because you can't go backwards. So like you have to find a collision, like you have to find the original, throw out the same hash function and find that collision. We're going to talk about that later because that's the last free response question. But for now, let's just move on because I want to be able to get through this and then answer all your questions. Okay, so second question, man in the middle is a valid common threat that must be considered. Yes, all right, yeah, this one's pretty easy. Cool. Okay, this one is a little tricky, so um, who knows the answer to this one? The Unix ACO can express all the same security policies as access control matrix. False? Oh, wow. Yeah, this, this one caused a lot of confusion last semester. So uh, just to recap for anyone who didn't know how you got that, so like you have like the ACLs and capabilities are instances of the access control matrix, and the big point that like is how I would think of this is like, Unix is like a specific one and like we have to remember that we're trying to think of like big abstract ideas that encompasses everything. So anyone confused about that? Sounds like you guys already got it. Cool. All right, uh, and Bell, whatever model, a subject S can read on an object and also another subject. Oh wait, I wrong one, sorry. True, yep, this one just straight up memorizing his slide. Um, I think this is the asset control slide 34. I even put it on here. Uh, authentication describes what you can do to a system. True, false, false, right. Because authorization is what you can do. And then, I don't know, this is a, I don't know if anyone remembers McLovin. Cool. Perfect security is achievable. Yep. Straight up, common sense. Salts are added to slow down the hashing process. Oh, cool, I'm hearing mixed reviews. All right, cool. It's actually false because all a salt is, is you have your plain text password 
It's all just like some random gibberish that gets tossed into it and then you throw into the hash. So that way the salt gets mixed up with the hash and it just makes it harder to find a collision. So like, here's a nice diagram of it that I found. So that's all salt is. You just throw it with your plain text password. Um, now you got like your salt and then it gets garbled up into some gibberish to get stored. Any questions about salts? Just remember that the salt is added before the hash function. That's the big one too. It's not added after. Uh, technical components of security are more important than human components. Yeah, cool. And I, I always love this like little picture. It like sums up anyone who has ever worked in IT. Like you got all this cool like security policies and mechanism, but it only takes user error to like defeat all of it. Okay, security is more important component in an is the most important component in an organization. False. Wow, and really? oh, you guys are good. Ah, it's false because I don't know, like. Yeah. Anyone want to discuss this? Yeah, that's that's when this is like the caveat of like I could be wrong. Let's talk about it. All right. Uh, an effective security policy must encounter encounter every conceivable threat. Right. It just goes back to like perfect security is impossible. Okay, so I'm gonna skip um, 11 and 12 because that relates back to hash functions, and we're gonna talk about it in the last free response. So we're gonna go straight to 1.13. If you guys have your practice midterms in front of you, so uh, yeah, here it is. Uh, true or false, the access control matrix is used to model what subjects have which rights on objects and other subjects. True? True? Everyone says true? Good job. Okay, uh, yeah, slide six and seven. You could remember the access control matrix. Here's your subjects and here's your subjects, so that's why you have that extra column because subjects can act on other subjects. And then I even posted the timestamp for when his lecture talks about that in case you guys want to go over it. For anyone who's confused about that, uh, good questions. Cool. Okay, when using DES, ECB mode is more secure than CBC mode. False. False. Cool. You guys memorized this. So for anyone who don't remember what ECB or CBC is, just remember ECB is the one is like just the block one, the electronic code block one, and then he used the example of like you're gonna encrypt this penguin, but it just turns to like this, and you can still actually see it. So that's why it's not very secure. So that's why cipher blockchaining is more secure because essentially you're um, scrambling the um, plain, like the plain text prior to the encryption portion. <laughs> Good. All right. All right. Awesome. Okay. Uh, okay. This is one's the free response. This one's pretty easy. What is the proposed security? CIA, good. Don't forget your triad. And then I even have like, examples to help people who still don't understand the concept. So like confidentiality, you should not be able to view migrates. Only people with proper, don't worry, slides will be posted. <laughs> Only people with proper access like Professor Dufay has, should be able to access migrate. And then you should not be able to change your grades. So none, none of the war games type stuff. And then availability, you should be able to see your grades on Gradescope in your assignments. Anyone confused? Cool. Okay, uh, describe the interaction between security policy and security mechanisms. What's up? Security mechanisms complement security policies. Right, so security policies are the rules and then the mechanisms enforce the rules. And then which one's more important? What'd you say? Which one's more important? <laughs> As I'm asking you because uh, you might ask that. Which one's more important? Both, good. They're both equally as important. It goes back to that where like you could have all the best security mechanisms you want, but user if the user doesn't actually like follow the rules, it doesn't really matter, does it? Okay. Um, so this is I can get this one. Can you guys hear me fine? I don't need the mic. Good. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna go over this question. So you were the security officer for an organization and your organization, huh? Oh, okay. 
has two groups of people who have a conflict of interest. They're working with different clients. Uh, so basically you wanna create an access control policy to completely block off the flow of information between these two groups. I'll use this. I need to. <laughs> just hold it up. Okay. So um, basically it's just asking what type of authentic access control mechanism do you use? So anyone have any thoughts? Yeah. Uh, I would say you would implement it with uh, like for mandatory access control because then you want to avoid like any human errors in particular mm -hmm. like discretionary or role based or SD or any of these. Mm -hmm. Any other ideas? Here's a description of some of them if you forgot. So the big one that you need to get the big takeaway, I think, of all the access control measures is discretion. So like who or what decides like access and that's like one of the big things or like the biggest takeaway is just like discretion so that's like the difference between all three of these so this question is kind of open-ended um like you you said mandatory access control that's a great answer um the thing is it's mandatory access control is kind of you can have um these are less of like perfect guidelines, you use one or the other. Um, you can have a mandatory access control with some elements of like a role-based access control. So basically for this question, as long as you justify your answer well enough, it should be fine. Um, but I would like to note that, um, so he went over discretionary access control and OC, what's that one? You guys remember? What was it? Owner. Oh, owner, yeah, okay. Yeah, so I just wanted to note that those two wouldn't necessarily be the best choices for this because your goal is to get them, you want these two groups of people to not be able to override the security policy at all. Um, okay, any questions on that one? Sorry. Yeah. The slides will be posted on the same Piazza link. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to post it and like have no one show up. <laughs> So anyone have questions on like the specific ones? So he's not gonna expect you to like know like the minute details of these. What I would focus on is the big overall idea. So that's why he gave you guys like a situation and then your job is just to choose one of these and justify it. So like, don't try to like memorize, I don't know, every minute detail on it. Yeah. DAC is discretionary access control. OCAC is originator controlled, I believe. Yeah. Um, so discretionary is, um, I believe, what was that? Oh, oh yeah, owner, whatever. Yeah, so the owner um, access control, that means whoever owns the object, it's up to them who can do what with that object. And um, discretionary, I believe, is that? Is that discretionary is owner based, and then the O is originator based. Oh, origin. No, sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah, you know more than I do. Um, it's recorded now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got to delete that. Um, yeah, so those would just be not the best choices for this particular problem, but for other situations, you could easily justify those as working. Oh, and then remember back to my discretion not to rely on just these slides. So like for the exam, he might flip it and ask like, if you want to keep classified material, which one would you use? Like that sort of thing. So you might want to know these two, so. Yeah. Oh, so like, let's say you want to manage classified information. Like you have a top secret, secret and unclassified and you want to manage who gets access to what, which access control model would you use? So that's what I'm saying. Like, don't just rely like, oh, I'm going to memorize R back, A back, and MAC, and then totally forget about DAC and OCAC. So, like, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's don't use like the practice midterm is great because it tells you what type of question is going to be on there, but don't rely just on this like you would for like a Calc one exam or something. Like, you might flip it, and then you guys will be caught flat footed because you only taught, like studied the first three. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Think of like think big big ideas. Don't try to like zoom in he's not like if you didn't know this on your practice exam he doesn't actually like minute details 
he wants like you to understand the big overarching concepts because you don't get a cheat sheet so any other questions on this one yeah oh you don't get a cheat sheet oh no you said it many times you don't get a cheat sheet there's no cheat sheets <laughs> we got on this one okay so the next question um <laughs> this is all you get. Okay. So um, this one's just asking how you would deal with a Caesar cipher given one. Um, well, I guess it assumes you don't know it is and you have to find that out. So any ideas on how you guys all did the assignment? Um, how would you figure out that it is a Caesar, Caesar cipher first of all? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Not yeah. Like yeah. So it would still appear like English. It would just appear shifted if you were to plot the frequencies. Yeah. What you have said, like the way that I thought of it as like you have realistically there's only 25 keys that it could possibly be. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to determine if it was a Caesar cipher, I would just prove Yeah, you could just try. Experiment. Yeah. If you want, yeah, you could just way. try to solve it to yeah. see if it is, first of all. Yeah. So then how would you solve it? Like that, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty much the only way. <laughs> There's, you can get technical with it, but you don't really need to because it's. Um, so, like he was saying just now, um, the exam, it's pretty likely you'll have similar questions, but not the same. So, for instance, they could ask um, this same question, but with a Visioneer cipher. Or RSA, or any of the other ciphers yeah. you learned. Yeah. So we can. Go over that if you guys have end. any questions about yeah. it at the end. We could go at the end. I'm right now I'm just trying to get through all the questions. That way you guys could start thinking about some of this stuff. Anyway, I saw again now. Oh, cool. So this all right, cool. So this one I actually worked a decent amount on because um I'm good. Okay. Anyone can hear me in the back, right? Talking loud enough? Cool. All right, so this one I kind of make an awesome visualization of it because I'm a visual learner and this one tripped me up at first, just reading his math notation, which I'm like, I don't know, I'm not a math student, I'm a CS student, right? Okay, so um, first you got your message M, and then these are the keys you have in your possession, right? So you have your, like Alice's public key, so the public key of Alice is P, little a, you have your secret key or private key, so you're Bob in this situation, so that's why it's S of B, and then um, don't worry so much on the right side, I'm just showing you like this is how Alice would open it. So first you would use your private key to encrypt the message. So that way that fulfills the how Alice will know that's from you because you're using your private key to lock up the box. And then next you would use Alice's public key to encrypt that. So now you have like two boxes, right? Everyone still following along on my awesome Adobe After Effects diagram? 3D modeling, yeah. Okay, so the pink is gonna be Alex's, Alice's possession. So she has her secret key, right? And her secret key can open up her public key. So that's why you use her public key to encrypt it. So that goes away. And then now, this is the important thing here. It's, it's what's PB? Public key of Bob, which is you. So you have to make sure that Alice actually has your public key. That's one of the big things. Like if she doesn't have that key, she can't decrypt your secret key box, right? So then she would use your key to decrypt it. And then Alice gets your message. Yeah. Uh, the question doesn't specify that key. Oh. This one it does. Maybe I didn't type it, but it, may, it might have said that. Make sure. Hold on. Okay, this question is six, right? Well, okay, but I make sure that only Alice could read it. I mean. Sure. Okay, uh, so recap first, you need to share Alice your public key because she needs it to decrypt yours later on. You're gonna use your private key to encrypt the message. And this is his notation on his PowerPoint slides. So like you have your secret of Bob message, can we see? And you're gonna use Alice's public key to encrypt that one. So I'm just gonna represent it P A of C, or we're just gonna call it C prime for now. 
and then now only Alice could read your message. Because if E tries to use the public key of Alice on that, on like your C prime, nothing, because only Alice's private key can decrypt it, right? Everyone still tracking that? And then E, so if she tries to use your public key, it's not gonna work on the outer box because it was encrypted with Alice's public key, right? So that's why it's not gonna work. Everyone, yeah. Yeah, so remember the analogy of like the key that only turns right and the key that only turns left? So that's what basically this is. So like, um, all right, well, we're gonna just move on. Or skip that so that we can see it. So like, Alice gets your message and she's happy. So like, you see how it's like secret, public, <coughs> secret, public. So essentially at the end, all those cancel each other out and you get M. So that's why. So like, if you have an extra P in there and there's no like secret key to decrypt that public key, then it's not gonna work and vice versa. So that's why at the end you get SP, yes. It's not, this is just like his notation is not actually in that order. Like I always thought of it as like having two boxes. Uh, yeah. So it's like to use the secret key on the inner layer, inner layer, like the public key on the outer layers? Mm -hmm. the well, the big one is like, you want to use Alice's public key on the outer layer. Yeah. Because no matter what key you throw at it, the only one that could decrypt it is Alice's secret key, which she should have and never ever share. Right, so it's like as only she Yep, so that's why it's secret of A, or S of A, which is secret of A. Anyone confused still? This is like a, important, yeah. Wait, what part? Well, because once you open that outer box, you now have this inner box that you encrypted with your secret key. So what can undo that? The pri your public key. So that's why it's important to have that outer box because you need to make sure that only Alice could access that outer box. I, I'm a visual learner, so this is, how, this is why I made this awesome graph, Adobe After Effects. Basically a graphic designer. All right, anyone's still confused. It's like a pretty important concept. Yeah. You said it's important that we know that Alice has our public key, but it doesn't say that she does, but does it assume that she does public? I, I would personally write, that's why like, I put to reiterate, like. First step, just give her your public key. Like that's the very first thing you should just write. That, knock it out. Like just in case you don't, you don't want to assume, right? Like it's a free response question. So like you want to show that you actually understand this concept. But so yeah, so that's why I'm saying step one, give Alice your public key. It doesn't matter. You could share that public key with anyone you want. That's why it's a public key. Like Eve could take her public key and it still wouldn't work because only her secret key can undo that outer box. Sure? All right, yeah. I'm pretty sure he'll accept an essay format. I mean, his, he's not an asshole, okay? Like, he, his goal is to make sure, like, you understand the big concepts. Like, oh, you didn't, you didn't put the, the proper thing on the outside. Like, <laughs> anyone else? Everyone understand our um, PGP keys and our uh, keys? Yeah, in the back. Uh, I would if you know it but I would just you could definitely write it like I would use P like I would use S of B to encrypt the message M like he's like I don't want to because I'm not a grader so I'm not I don't want to say absolutely you don't have to use notation but I would just focus on understanding the big idea and if you show that I'm pretty sure they're more focused that you understand that like public and private key encryption over oh you didn't use the proper notation that the S of B takes a function of M or whatever. Anyone else? Cool. Okay, and then, so this one asks for three different types of authentication mechanisms. I saw this on Piazza earlier, I couldn't get to it. Um, and we wanna list, them out, list out three? Okay, so, so this is the, like I always remember it was like what, what, like three what's and where? So like you got your what, what, and where. So like what you know, so like this picture, you know your password, right? So let's think of two-factor authentication because that's what some of you guys use, hopefully. <laughs> if not, I hope you do after you take this class. Um, so what you know, you know your password, so that's one. And then everyone has their phone with you, so that's what you possess. 
And then that's how, you know, like when you get two-factor authentication, it sends you the push, like that secondary code. So that's what you have. And then the third is what you are. So like biometrics, um, CAPTCHA to make sure you're not a robot. Like we gotta make sure you're human, right? Like a human's trying to log on. And then where you are, so you could do like IP tracking or whatever. You only have to do pick three of these. I just put four. I wanna set you guys up for success. Yeah. I would definitely write out the mechanism itself and then provide the example to prove you actually know what you're saying. <laughs> I mean, I guess like, I don't know, imagine you're a grader and someone just put CAPTCHA. Like that's, <laughs> yeah, it would be what you are, but you would want to say that you would like, what you are would be an example would be, I'm proving that I'm human by using CAPTCHA. Yeah. Like your phone. So like, you know how your phone sends you like a text message when you try to log into your bank or something? I don't know if your bank makes you do that yet. It's just what you possess. So like some people have like UB keys. So that's something you possess. So that's why like two factor authentication, you choose two of these. Like what you know, everyone knows your password. Like, I mean, everybody individually knows their own password, right? So that's what you know. And then what you possess, most people have a phone, I hope. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. Yeah, like whitelisting, geo location. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, like you can only use your work computer that's plugged in and locked to this one desk. Anyone else use anyone need clarification? So there's a video about like two factor authentication. I just like the picture, so you don't have to watch the video. I just like the diagram. It kind of like helps you memorize it. You memorize two-factor authentication, you're going to get at least two out of three. That's a D. <laughs> okay. Uh, so properties of hash functions. So this is the last one. Cool. So there's actually three. So anyone want to give me the first one? It's actually in one of the questions for true and false, if you guys have your practice in your terms. Hmm? Perfect. Yeah. And then so what does that mean? Yep, it only goes one way. So given a hash, you should be able to go backwards and get the message. Uh, and then, well, I'm just going to give you the second one. The second one's a little confusing. So I'm going to get to it. So the second one is also known as weak collision resistance, but I would just memorize the um, second pre-image resistance. So basically, you're given the message M and the hash function with it. And then it should be in... <laughs> Use the word impossible, but you should be able to find another message that's different that hashes the same thing. So this is primarily used to make sure that people don't manipulate a file and then get away with it. So like, so some like I don't know if you guys ever noticed like when you go on websites and download a certain file, they have like a hash with it. You could actually check like run your own hash function on that file and make sure the hashes match. And that's what this is supposed to like ensure is like, I'm gonna skip that. So it's make sure that like, I can't make up a BS message that's completely different, throw into the same MD5 hash and get the same output with it. Because now it's impossible for you to determine that these were the same files. Because I mean, you would think they're the same files, but they're not. Uh, let's go you in the back because you were first. Because you're given both of these. So you're given a message and a hash. You should not be able to make up your own message, throw into the same hash function that you're given, and it outputs the same hash. That's what this is mostly saying. That's how I memorize it. Uh, anyway, you rose your hand, right? Yeah. So there's a video that explains this with the timestamp. It's pretty good. I, I think it's pretty good. That's where I stole this picture. I don't know. I'm trying to set you guys up for success. You haven't noticed. You only have to choose two of these. So you could pick the first and third one because everyone knows collision resistance. Like, because that's the only way you beat or you break hashes, right? Is you find a collision. All right. Anything else? Okay, cool. All right. So if you play League of Legends, you know that icon. So you got your final hours. You got 17 and a half or 16 and a half hours before the midterm. Um, 
we're gonna go over like any crazy questions. It's only 5.30, so that's why I wanted to blast through this for everyone who showed up on time. So, um, questions. Oh, wait, um, let's actually go back to the midterm. So like 1.11 is crypto cryptological hash function should be resistance to free image attack. That's true, we just went over why. And then the output of crypto hash cryptographic hash function should be reversible. That's false. And then there's 1.14, which I hope you all get, which is you should build your own cryptography system, crypto system. Yeah, good. All right. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna do questions. It's only 5:30, so we got an hour. We'll be here for an hour. Um, I don't know. Questions?